And it's really my great pleasure to introduce another boss of mine, Dr. Xiaoping Li, who is a, I don't have to, she's, she's really superb. She's the Center for the Human Nutrition at UCLA. And I say it's my boss and have done so much things, not only for UCLA, but also the national level with the American Society of Nutrition. And we will try to clarify some of the discussion with our microbes on the gut that we heard earlier in the morning. And Dr. Lee will sorting out about what good nutrition, what is good for your bugs that you have now eaten your lunch. And we'll see how good it is for your health. Dr. Lee. Good afternoon, everyone. So you know why I'm always moving. My uh, do mentor, Dr. Go, always keeps me on my toes. Um, it is a truly a pleasure to be back again to speak with the, all of you. Each year, it is really a great event and put together by Agi and everyone involved in planning. I think this is a once in a year time we learn what we have accomplished the year before and also planning for next year. So this year's job I was giving is talking about really why food matters, even when we're talking about cancer. Here is the reason. And we now learning aging and cancer are overlapping on the past and aging and the changes associated with aging is actually very much similar, like, or I, like I said, overlapping with the cancer process. So those two, really it is um, on the same platform without exaggeration. And the more importantly, and we talked about a lot about genetics, we, whenever we talk about genetics, we're talking, uh, thinking about the two strands of DNAs we get from our parents. that have been giving us wonderful excuses, always point a finger to them, say, gee, it's all from them, I, I cannot do anything about it. But today, the truth is, who you are today, we call a phenotype. And it is not necessarily predominantly decided by the genetics you inherited from your parents. As this pie chart is showing you. Only 30% who you are today, it is from what you inherited from your parents, but the other 70% who truly is in your own hands. Those are the two things we talk about almost every day, and that is nutrition and exercise. Both are really there with us. The choices are ours every day, every meal, every hour. So the reason we start thinking about genetics today, it is more of who we are and how we lived our life, is also because there are significant genetic contributions to our body that not necessarily are human DNAs. And that is all those little bugs we cannot see. We give them an overall name called microbiota. So that is the overarching name we give all of them all together. Each one of us right now, it is a truly a little cloud of ourselves that include our human cells, the bacteria we know, and also the fungi and very old microbes, we don't even study them carefully. We just have not get to that point. We just call them archaic, ancient is all we know. And also including viruses. And with that all have said, we all understand, not all bacteria cause disease. Most of them are actually part of us, and part of our body, so do fungi fungi, archaea, and viruses. Where are they existing? They're existing everywhere our body interface with the environment. So with that have said, in our nose, mouth, GI tract, meaning gastrointestinal tract, and also skin, 
our urinary tract, and reproductive system, because this is how we connect to our world. And with advanced technology, we know now the environment not necessarily directly interface with our body, with the human cells. In between, and there are those microbes we cannot see with our eyes, but they, in large degree, interface between the environment and our body. Take a moment to think. Our human body, it is actually not a solid piece like we think. We are more actually like donuts. And the oral cavity all the way to the other end, it is actually a hollow tube. And with also specialty of mucosa. It's not like the skin really serving a barrier to separate our human body from the environment. The mucosa, it is designed for our body, for our human cells to interface with the environment doing all the message and also nutrients, compounds, exchange. So now you can fully understand why those microbes are important to us. And here is also, and make you feel they are really powerful. And if you, we collect all the genetic material, that including DNA, RNA, from head to toe, also including all those microbes, here it is showing you the ratio. 99% of the genetic material on us, inside us, are from those microbes. Human DNA, RNA, only account for about 1%. So human being is truly living in an ocean of microbes without exaggeration. And looking a little bit further away from immediately connect with our um, body and everything, living things on Earth, it is connected with microbes. And the plants actually is a result of interactions of the microbes, including the fungi in the, in the soil, working with the roots, and that actually determines very much what kind of nutrients, we call nutrients because they can be helping uh, us, our body, help the plants to really contain whatever compounds or nutrients in that specific plants. Obviously, it is a dynamic as well. And now we realize if we move in a plant that can be small, um, you know, a plant to big trees, why sometimes it fail to survive the new environment? It is now we know beyond the soil, the pH, and all of those, you have a lot to do with the microbiomes in the new environment as well. So just to give you a, a feel for with the advance of technology, we can truly now not just imagining, but study those little um, you know, cr creatures who they are actually truly a part of us. Now come to our body function. We have not found any single system. Our body is not related directly or indirectly with microbes. And so that has make it so important for us not only take care of our human cells, but also taking care of our good neighbors, our part of our body, the microbes. And we used to think, we just all had lunch, wonderful lunch, and we will, quote, digest the food, absorb all the nutrients, all the waste will go to the colon. And there, we even gave them a wonderful name of waste. Now we know, actually, that is not all about. And all the food we eat, unless absorbed to inside our body, meaning made to the blood, and they are leftovers for our wonderful friends, the microbiota, to live on. With that have said, every single bite we actually take is not just for us, the only human cells. We are also taking care. The microbes has been there with us since the minutes we were born, as you know, that's up to the technology we know today. 
Maybe earlier, we do not know. So now there are new meanings when we make choice and what to eat. And it is not just and what we classically or conventionally think and not just those compounds made to our blood matters. And the food we feed the microbes and the microbes in turn and break down those big molecules, release small ones, and then further get into our body system, it is as equally important as those molecules direct get into our blood, if not more important. So that is what I'm trying to discuss with everyone today. Now come to cancer, and we are now beyond the think. Cancer is a DNA mutation. It is our immune system could no longer have them you know, in check. And that's the time we can clinically and find them. We start to change the balance that is knock down the cancers and supporting our immune system so the immune system can take over again. We're back to in our overall health. Now we can see from this cartoon and the environmental factors that including the diet and drugs, I give a general term about drugs, we can talk about that including chemotherapy, including antibiotics, all others, and also microbiota. All of those actually really have impact on the, in, in the relationship or the balance of a cancer and our immune system. So everything we gotta do have one goal in mind, and that is to change the balance, really have our immune system take control again. And that is where we go back to harmony and we back to enjoy our life and move on really to live not only longer, but with a high quality of life. I heard that this morning, and we had a talk on antibiotics and uh, chemo uh, response. And now this is being widely studied um, in the science field. And there are also clear observations for human and come to immunotherapy, not necessarily the conventional chemotherapy and many of us are familiar with. For immunotherapy, and we know and for more than one study, human study, and when you, patients have to take antibiotics, particularly a broad spectrum, meaning knock down a lot of bacteria, and actually those patients are less likely to respond well to immunotherapy. This is one kind of a chemotherapy. And that also stimulated an interest in the field as to what we should do instead of just think about chemo drugs. By the way, those drugs are the big compounds come from plants as well. So now we also think about how to make our body, including all those microbes, to work with us, work with those reagents, and that can be immunotherapy or conventional chemotherapy or radiation even surgery before or after surgery, how can we quickly alter the balance, really eradicate you know, the cancer cells to return our body to normal states? And to give that, uh, everyone another example, and you probably heard a lot, the microbes have a lot to do with people overweight and have diabetes. And even in the field, we think we kind of studied well, know well, and there's a role, a simple important role the microbes play. And look at those kids in Africa, you know, they're severely malnourished, and we, you know, generally think as long as we give them calories, that can be white bread, that can be beans, everything, voila, they are not gonna be malnourished. It turned out to be not necessarily the case. And now we actually can learn from this uh, milestone study. If you have the bacteria from the gut of the malnourished kid and transplanted to mice, no germs, we call germ-free mice. 
And another mice, same genetic background, get the microbes from a normal healthy uh, children. You feed them exactly same food. You don't limit their diet. What you can see from the mice is that if the mice get the bacteria from the malnourished kid, in spite of you gave them adequate nutrition, they still malnourished. So there are very significant signals is being you know, transmitted through the gut bacteria, obviously. And looking at that, we're gonna learn today, if we are, after um, you know, surgery or chemo, we're losing weight, we're no longer just thinking about, let's get the calories, right? I, this year, I'll be at UCLA for 30 years. And beginning of my practice, we really thought about anything with high calories. And with fat to be the most effective carrier of energy, we had our days, encourage our patient, you know, really just have butters and ice cream and anything you can get your hands on with calorie. And we thought we were doing all our patients a favor. So today, we really have to relook at everything and to think what we really thought was, you know, really just the rule of uh, the, you know, rule of the thumb we should do. And we, I talked about microbes. The easiest answer would be, gee, not a problem. Yeah, since we need those critical microbes, why don't we just start taking them? How many of you have taken those live bacteria called probiotics? Okay, there are quite a few of you. And those are pretty powerful, okay? Each capsule, they come in with 50 billion of live bacteria. God, that's a big number, right? And they also, you know, some of them say, hey, we have five different strains. We have lactobacilli, we have, you know, bifido, and we have all fancy ones. And what do we know about that? So I want to tell everyone the study just beginning. And there really no solid scientific evidence yet to really tell us which one we should have. Or, and that is not the right target to evaluate. I'll tell you why. So you remember I said the number. Each capsule has 50 billions up to five different strengths. But guess what? Inside our gastrointestinal tract alone, how many bacteria we have? How about 100 trillion? Okay? So you can think about the percentage of 50 billion versus 100 trillion. That is assuming all of them made it through the stomach, the low pH, the acidity is supposed to kill them all. If you are not killed there, and the small intestine comes in with digestive enzymes, will break you into parts, right? That's assuming you are liable to get down to the colon. And the other thing is how many different kind we have in the GI tract since the, you know, the, the pills have about five, only about at least 500 different kinds in our GI tract, all right? So you can see, well, even with the best technology, we're not sure we're really making a difference. And the other very important concept we have learned in the pa just past five years is the following. If we take example, a garden as an example as our gut bacteria, only talk about the gut, we learned the most important thing is diversity. It is not matters, has to be everyone have rose garden or lily or whatever specific plants. Number one is diversity. The community has to be diverse. The second most important thing, the community has to be resilient. If you get an antibiotic, you have to take for bad guys to come in, and the community can remain relatively stable, particularly those good guys, and rebound it back right after the bacteria, uh, the antibiotic treatment is over. And number three, then come down to, are there key players 
and in different disease need to be at a certain level. That is the, st the stage we're really at. So with that have said, come back to nutrition and come back to take care of our genes, take care of our microbes. The most effective way you can do for yourself it is through diet. And we call all the food the microbes eat as under one umbrella called prebiotics. So prebiotics is what you have just taken for lunch. What your body has not taken, if you travel down to the large intestine in particular, you are feeding them, you are shaping your um, microbes communities, you are really doing the right thing. And most of the prebiotics, obviously, from plants, because that's how human beings evolved. We evolved on eating plants. But I also want to say, and there are a lot of other things we thought only for human beings, it turned out to be necessary for the microbes as well. One example is vitamin B2. It turned out to be the microbes need that vitamin to keep their environment free of oxygen. So this is one very important vitamin for human cells and also for the microbes. Now come to even the large compounds like you know tea, and many of you drink green tea, and because that's most of the research has done. Why we don't stop black tea? Because that is the most consumed tea in worldwide only because green tea has a small molecules make to our blood. We can check, we can feel confident, we know what we're doing. The black tea is fermented and they're large molecules. We never able to ta test that in the blood. So we sort of, eh, not much a study was done. But from our own center, we have realized the black tea really get down to the colon the bacteria work on it, and then release small molecules and get to our blood. If we talk about health benefit, black tea is at least as beneficial, if not more than green tea. It's just how we study it and how we look at it. One thing I got to say, our ancestors are smart all right. They may not know all the technology, but they know what works what does your body good, right? And I had a conversation earlier about, uh, with the speaker before me about cannabinoids. Cannabinoids predominantly are not absorbed into your uh, blood and predominantly get down to the bacteria world. And I can imagine uh, how that interface will work and we're dying to collaborate and to see what we can learn from there. So. Now come to really what we got to eat, the same picture that I showed you, you know, uh, two years ago, and we got to take care of our own cells, take care of our microbes, and half the plate should be plants, and a combination of cooked vegetables and salad, and human beings are the only beings on Earth take advantage of fire, and probably that to cook food, not to kill each other. Um, that's actually probably one of the main reasons we separated ourselves from the rest of the animal world. So cooked, cooking is a digestive process. So you, to make up the you know, concern of losing water-soluble water vitamins, so combination would be the best, right? So we have whole grains and we have lean proteins. And this is give you another great reason to think where the best carbohydrate come from. And I understand there are a lot of concerns about sugar, but it really depends on in what quantity, where they come from, what is the vehicle. The best carbohydrate to give our body energy, what we need are plants, vegetable and fruit. And not so much of those refined carbohydrate. It gotta be portion controlled. And the protein, and we're talking about you know, the lean proteins, chicken breast, turkey breast, seafood, fish, eggs, legumes, and whole grains. And also when we need and um, really clean, pure proteins, they are 
there to support you with adequate amount of protein, and even when you're going through chemotherapy, and we can figure out the ways for your body to at least get those essence of them, including you know, protein popsicles, as you can see from this figure. And there are also healthy oil, and they function differently, not just energy, but also have other uh, actually benefit. We actually involved in a study right now with 1,000 people eating one avocado every day. We want to see that much fat every day, what it's going to do to your body. So we have ongoing research on that. And lastly, I want everyone to remember, we are all different. It's not just we have different color of hair, different body shape, metabolism-wise, cancer grows, responds to therapy. We are all different. Particularly, we consider we also have a different activity, and we have different capability to do chores, but I do want to tell you, if you cannot walk more than three steps in a second, you know, that's what the, the speed it is, and you are really uh, in shape. We need to improve quickly. And that is more, predict less survival than even overall cancer patient. So that is something we also want to keep in mind. After activity, sleep well. And that is a topic I wish we had more time to talk. And reduce stress and do not function like either this man or woman, right? So to summarize, and remember UCLA, right? Yay, vegetables, less starch, lean protein, uh, activity, and we're going to have a panel discussion, and here's we really start to offer all our patients, multidisciplinary, and take care of you as you, from head to toe, from physical need to emotional need. Thank you very much. Questions. I really pleased with the with the lunch choice, right? We got all the colors we have talked about before. One of them I still remember two years ago. Color represent the special nutrients in that um, plants or vegetables. So that is the reason we have color visions. All right, we're not having color vision for just the TV and iPhones. We are on the top of the food chain. We gotta use what we have learned during evolution. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk. Um, one question I had was you were talking about, you know, obviously not all sources of sugar are equal. Yes. And I've had friends who tell me they don't like to eat fruits because they're worried about the sugar content in there. So maybe could you elaborate more for some of the folks in the audience? Okay, so I would give an example of, about spending money, all right, to talk about sugar. Um, it is never true you cannot buy ex expensive items as long as you're spending within the mean. It is also not true as long as something's cheap, you can buy as many as you want. And it's the same same concept with sugar. And the sugar all depends on what else is coming in with the sugar. And our entire blood right now, for most of us, if not all, sitting here, the, all the sugar in the blood right now is one cube of sugar. Okay? One cube only. That's how much our blood can hold. If you have decided, yeah, have a Coca-Cola, Nine cubes comes in. And also because they're simple sugar, they rush in to the liver. What does the liver do? Try not to get the sugar, really get your blood level go up. You're working with the pancreas, immediately convert most of the sugar to triglyceride. Okay, that's one kind of cholesterol. And then try to deposit to other part of the body. To more exactly answer your question, and really depends on when you take the sugar, what is your body's energy re requirement or supply looks like.
The second thing also matters how easily they can come into your blood. Simple sugar rushes in. If you have complex sugar, and like your vegetables, they have sugar, but the digestion takes time, the release, the amount of sugar is very small, so it make a difference. For example, I mean, we have nuts outside, the pistachio, we have done studies. And pistachio, you know, has sugars, and we, if we match pistachio with whole wheat bread, all right, pistachio would not cause, even if they are about the same calories, would not cause the sugar go up, whole wheat bread would. So it's all relevant. If you have not had anything this morning, lunchtime have a fruit, gee, it's very healthy. If you already have your 12 on steak, all of a sudden you remember, one apple a day, keep the doctor away, Ooh, then the apple may not be serving the purpose, right? There. Uh, you mentioned vitamin B2. Could yes. you say something in general about B vitamin in general and also vitamin D for cancer patients and are taking vitamin supplements helpful in addition to good nutrition? Okay, great question. So uh, vitamin, all right, so I would say the following. If you actually eating at least five cups of vegetables and fruit all together, and particularly the vitamin B and water soluble vitamins, additional supplementation may not necessary, all right? But if you're going through treatment and chemotherapy, very bad oral intake, and take one more tea, and particularly during your treatment. During treatment and versus long term is different. But now I'm gonna specifically talk about vitamin D. That is not water soluble, is fat soluble. And we have been known what vitamin D for a long time, but we thought that was only related to calcium regulation and some degree phosphorus, related to calcium as well, related to our bone. The recent research actually have demonstrated vitamin D, it is beyond to be a vitamin. It also functions in a lot of degree as a hormones, particularly in most of the study we've done in colon cancer. It actually helps the cells as the cells to mature or proliferate and less likely become cancer. And actually the most advances made is not that, but it's in vitamin D and our immune system. And that have, you know, uh, progressed rapidly. And vitamin D is essential for your immune system, including allergy, asthma, uh, eczema, all of that. We have a relationship with vitamin deficiency. Together with that, we're spending most of our time indoors. If we, even we're in California, if we go out, guess what? We put some blocks on, right? And we don't want wrinkles, we don't want skin cancer. So the vitamin D deficiency, it is a quite widespread. I actually consider myself very careful, and I had my annual uh, last year, my vitamin D levels are only 17. Ideal level is above 50. If you in a range of a 20 to 50, you need to take at least 1,000 units every day, try to make it up. And if you are 50 above, you can take the government recommended 600 IU, international unit. If you less than 20, then we actually really have to look at including injectable 50,000 IU. All right, so that is that. Oh, I'm so sorry, go ahead. Okay, so there has been a lot of conflicting publications on canola oil these days. So I want to ask you for your insight on that and other vegetable oils too. Okay, but her questions about canola oil and also overall, uh, what is oil to, uh, to use or healthy? Rule number one, if you're just gonna have one tablespoon to cook your food, it probably doesn't matter much. I do want to say, try not to use olive oil to cook because the temperature won't go high enough. Your food is not tasty, it's usually saggy. Also, it will be, become smoke. So for a high temperature, relatively healthy, with more actually even some omega-3 uh, you know, uh, um, in it, canola is one of them. There's a, Coconuts is a saturated fatty acid, and there are actually studies saying all saturated fat is not necessarily all the same. 
And so to answer your question, to compare all the vegetable oil, canola is uh, uh, being recommended together with avocado and a few others is because it does not have that much predominantly omega-6. It has some monounsaturated fatty acid and also omega-3. It's just where the double bound it is um, located. But like I said, if you use one tablespoon to cook, it doesn't really matter that much. If you're gonna stir fry every meal, now we need to talk, all right? Thank you. Thank you very much.